Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Devani. My very, very special guest. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to have Dan Held with me today. Uh, finally, after uh, seeing him on um, uh, live, personally, face to face, on the Value of Bitcoin conference on June 3rd in Munich, in Germany, it was really a, a super event. Welcome, Dan. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, listen, I've been following you for a really long time. I've been reading your articles. I mean, your articles are really brilliantly written and elaborated. It goes really into the depth and essence, succinctly, you know, into every aspect of Bitcoin. So, you know, for because it's about all comprehension, my utmost really top priority and mission for myself is really to educate people um, and and trigger, initiate, you know, the process of mass adoption. Um, uh, I mean, learning, studying, understanding comprehension, you know, this is like a process that's gonna take time anyway, but I just want, you know, people at least to start buying a, a fraction of a, of a Bitcoin, you know, a handful of Satoshis and just hold on to it, hodl as we say. So, um, there, there's a special series I've started with uh, some of the, you know, uh, uh, Bitcoiners that you might know. And it's about, um, you know, um, the reason I guess people um, do not wake up to this Bitcoin reality, uh, to the monetary, financial, economical reality is um, in the modern Western world, the people don't have the pain points. They don't feel it like people in Venezuela, Turkey, Iran or whatever. So my thesis is sort of, okay, if they don't feel it, if you can't, you know, comprehend it sort of uh, on, a, on a level that is, you know, affects your exist existence, which, which it doesn't actually, you know, I mean, if you talk to people, if they say, you know, what do I care about Bitcoin? You know, I can pay my coffee or whatever with my credit card, uh, uh, bank card or whatever, or cash. But uh, the other side of it would be to explain or, or to like visualize what is possible, what is a possible reality that we could have in whatever, five, 10, 20 years, uh, uh, you know, in the future. And, uh, you know, Safed and Amuz with his book, The Bitcoin Standard, whom we also met at the, at the conference whom I had talked to, he's a great inspiration. So before I wanna, you know, before I go on on a rant, I just wanna ask you, what kind of reality do you see like on a monetary, financial, economical, technological and scientific level once we have a monetary root layer or whatever foundation on Bitcoin? Yeah, great question. So this is uh, sort of like what would happen in hyper-Bitcoinization or like post-hyper-Bitcoinization, what's the impact on society? Exactly. Thank you. So I think starting with the basics, money is stored time and energy. So it's all the energy and time you spent to earn it. And it represents that stored capability in the in the form of purchasing power which means you can go use that to purchase goods and services at a later date so the preservation of that that money or the preservation of the per unit you know uh, the the measuring stick essentially the 21 million bitcoins is hugely beneficial for society because uh, when when that occurs it means that there can be no dilution of people's stored energy and time. There can be no centralized mechanism to aggregate and seize that wealth from that stored energy and time from billions of people. Whereas now the people in control have direct access to all of these individuals' savings, which is also their stored energy and time. So I think it's huge because one, it allows people to be more free. I think that is like the ultimate purpose of Bitcoin is it's really about freedom. When you can store your wealth in something that's really hard to seize, then that's truly, truly being free. It doesn't matter if you can speak freely, if your funds can be seized instantly, it doesn't really mean that much. What means a lot is having your entire life savings somewhere that is very, very hard for someone more powerful than you to seize it. So I think what what that does is it reduces the role of governments, it reduces the amount of war that occurs, um, wars are very expensive, and if people withhold their money from funding wars or other very uh, wasteful endeavors that are that are uh, typically started with governments, it'll make the world a more efficient place. It'll make the world a less violent place. 
Um, if you can imagine a world where federal, you know, the, you'll see that, for example, the U.S. federal budget you know, is cut by 90 percent and that money goes back to citizens. Uh, we enter a very, very prosperous time where money is being allocated more effectively to where governments are smaller, which means businesses and individuals can allocate capital towards things that will generate a higher ROI than if a government would have touched them. So I think that's a huge leap forward in terms of economic efficiency, standard of, of living, uh, and as well, reducing violence and enabling people to control and, and have freedom of the future. Excellent. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've, I went through your articles again and tried to, you know, find at least um, uh, a few uh, lines that, that um, are in direct connection with that specific topic I want to talk to you about. And you wrote in, uh, I think it was the fourth part of uh, your great article series, Planting Bitcoin, which I would recommend everyone to read. Um, it's about the, uh, the, the part four, it's called gardening, uh, sort of, uh, I think the garden, you mean the community, right? Uh, that's uh, right. It's that's right. It's, uh, yeah. So the sentence uh, uh, is um, quoting out of your article. It says, if Bitcoin grows much larger, it may force governments to become a voluntary organization. And through, ho through hodling, we may finally be free. I mean, it's such a simple but very, you know, deep uh, wisdom that you actually, you know, uh, uh, written because it goes directly, you know, it touches that that specific topic we wanted to talk about because there's this chapter in Safed and Amu's book where he talks, you know, the comparison of the gold standard, you know, the original, real right. original innovations in the 19th century under the gold standard, under, go, under hard money compared to the 20th century central banking fiat easy money, uh, which he says, you know, 20th century is actually more or less optimization, you know, uh, improvement, refinement of of, of a lot of other original innovations which happened in the 19th century on the gold standard. So my vision, my you know, sort of desire is to make people comprehend that this is like beyond maybe our imagination and, and comprehension, what we can achieve once we have roots at this monetary root lay of Bitcoin. And I mean, my personal challenge would be but that's maybe uh, you know a daydreaming <laughs> uh, would be like four billion people by the year 2024. I know it's unrealistic, but if we can reach like a fraction of that number, just four billion people holding a, a smallest fraction of a Bitcoin. I mean, not you know, besides the price, the value of Bitcoin going you know uh, beyond astronomically you know by order of magnitude. Um, what do you see what, what, or what can you, how would you, how would you visualize it? In terms of adoption or? Uh, what yeah, would... exactly. First adoption, you know, so how can we really, I mean, we are far away, you know, from, uh, I heard you talk in one of your recent interviews, you said you wouldn't, and you're so right, you wouldn't trust uh, your grandma with the private keys or something <laughs> like that. It was so funny. I was like, yeah, that's it. You know, we, it's not easy cheesy. It's not, we are far away, you know, from easy cheesy ch plug and play. I don't know how the internet works, but we play with it. We work exactly. with it every day. So this is how it should to be. But I don't think it's a real challenge or like an art, you know, to just buy and hold. That's it. I mean, we're, we're not really asking much of people. We're just saying, you know, invest into your own future. Yeah, and that's where I think hodling is a sort of a lifestyle. Um, that in my first article, when I started writing, which I only started writing in September 2018, mm -hmm. and when I started writing, my first article that I wrote was Hodlers are the Revolutionaries. Yeah. Because when I got into Bitcoin in 2012, that was a feeling that I had. That Bitcoin is about freedom and we're revolutionary fighters. Um, which by the way, I, I mean that word in a non-violent way. Mm -hmm. Of course. Uh, I believe in peaceful uh, protests. <laughs> but bowlers are revolutionaries because we took tremendous risk. Um, and I think at the top of the article, we've got the quote from Mark Twain. Let's see. There's this. Yeah. In the beginning of a change, a patriot is a scarce man and brave and hated and scorned. When his cause succeeds, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. Beautiful. 
<laughs> yeah, hodlers are the ones who took on the risk, the early, early risk of you know managing their own private keys and learning about Bitcoin and challenging their own assumptions around how does the world work and how does money work and how does the economy work and how do central banks work? And we were the ones who were bold enough to challenge that and to believe. And hodlers play, I would argue, one of the most critical parts in Bitcoin where you know a lot of people really over-index on developers or they're over index on miners. I think hodlers play the most important part because hodlers breathe life into the protocol. Thank if no you. one valued Bitcoin, then there'd be no one to mine it and there'd exactly. be no developer working on it. So yeah. hodlers are the revolutionaries and the core part of what makes Bitcoin great. You know, through hodling, it is your nonviolent vote against uh, central banks and governments. It's a peaceful vote for yourself. It's a peaceful vote for uh, you know, it's a, it's a vote for you. It's a vote against all of the crazy political battles that are going on where, where each side, whether, you know, in the United States, we have the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. They're both, you know, tugging and pulling at your, at your wallet, trying to get a hold of it. And with Bitcoin, you can make a vote for you and you can vote to put your money in and hold it in Bitcoin. And that's a vote for freedom. So I, I think it's uh you know, being hodling, I think, is kind of a lifetime or a lifestyle as well. By reducing your current consumption, you sort of embrace the minimalist philosophy, which is about lowering your time preference, reducing consumption, which is a moral good. Because when you reduce your consumption, you allow other people to consume at cheaper, at cheaper rates because uh, you reduce demand in the market, which increases the amount of supply. So you reduce your current consumption, which it makes all goods and services more available to everyone else. And then you store your value in this, in this new currency that ultimately will bring about greater freedom for humankind. Um, so hodling is an altruistic act as well. It's altruistic and uh, ultimately a morally good thing to do. Exactly. And, you know, I know you, you understand, you have a pretty deep understanding, comprehension of the, uh, you know, the principles and the interconnectedness of the principles of Austrian economics. I mean, which we have never been taught, unfortunately, with, you know, whether we're talking about school or, or mainstream education or even universities, they're all, you know, brainwashed with this Keynesianism. And, you know, I found this, uh, this, this quote on, on page 72 on, uh, you know, on Safed and Amu's book, uh, you know, there's Hayek, one of the, you know, great sort of legends of Austrian economists. You know, sometimes I wonder, Dan, what would these uh, uh, Austrian economists who are already dead, like Menger, Mises, Hayek, what would they say today? I mean, to Bitcoin, would they really turn around in the graves or would they say, oh my God, people wake up. I mean, this is your, this is the chance you've been waiting for in human history. This is the scarcest money you have. And there's this quote on page 72 where he said uh, in, a, in an interview on, in 1984, you know that quote probably, but I'm going to read it anyway for the listeners and viewers. He says, um, I don't believe we shall ever have a good money again before we take the thing the, the money out of the hands of government. That is, we cannot take it violently out of the hands of government. All we can do is by, slum, by some sly roundabout way introduce something that they cannot stop. I mean, is Bitcoin that thing which they cannot stop finally? Yeah, I mean, Satoshi architected Bitcoin to be the most resilient species of money ever created. Um, and that required extreme engineering uh, prowess in terms of coordinating all of the different incentives, for example, like how Bitcoin mining works. Bitcoin mining is actually more about physics than it is about code because it's proof of work is provably validating that you've used energy in the real world, which faking, you cannot fake energy consumption. You cannot break the laws of thermodynamics. So Bitcoin's security is rooted in thermodynamics, which is the core construct of the entire universe, uh, which is really, really cool. And so, you know, I think a lot of the, unfortunately, a lot of the Austrian economics uh, side, a lot of them believe that uh, for a commodity money to have value, the original commodity, there has to be an original commodity which has utility to have value. Uh, you could imagine like the, the gold bugs make this argument often, which is that gold has utility use cases in, in electronics and, and uh, other purposes. And then as well, you know, for example, if you had like, let's say, um, you know, you have like corn as the, as the commodity money, then, you know, corn has some base layer of utility. 
Um, as Connor Brown puts it, which he did this really brilliantly, which he said this really brilliantly, is that Bitcoin has no utility and that's a great thing. It has no other use than being money. Um, when gold or property is used as a store of value, it diminishes the actual raw utility it has by itself. Mm -hmm. um, if gold wasn't used for its store of value purposes, we'd have cheaper electronics or better electronics. If real estate wasn't used as a store of value, my rent would be much cheaper in San Francisco. <laughs> and so Bitcoin, Bitcoin's pure utility is being money. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of Austrian economics, uh, people who, you know, whether it be economists or people in that space, just don't understand that. And they can't understand that Bitcoin is just a raw utility being money rather than like having dual purpose. And, and also they don't understand mining very well and they consider that like a waste versus it being a, 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 a you know an energy shield yeah so you know hayek i think i think hayek might have understood its importance um I'm, you know i i think like it takes a, a pretty big leap for most people to accept the idea of digital money mm -hmm. and then to understand proof of work and then to understand the 21 million hard cap um these all take quite a bit of of really you know you really have to dig into it and really understand it and that's why i started writing is i once i realized these things i wanted to make it simple for everyone else to understand you know once you climb up there you you, you lower down the ladder to help everyone else up as well um so i think i think hayek would have liked bitcoin's 21 million hard cap though mm -hmm. uh, so he talks about for hayek he, he kind of early on started to realize that money is information that money and prices convey information in the market. And Saifedean talks about this in his book as well, that prices reflect uh, information in the market. For example, the price of uh, a share of Apple reflects all potential expectations of Apple's earnings. And that reflects everyone's shared, uh, shared aggregate data that we all believe. Uh, if it wasn't that, then the price would be different. Um, also known as efficient market hypothesis, which uh, by default, the markets are reflecting that information is not necessarily predictive it's just descriptive of the current environment so i think hayek with like the local knowledge problem i think he would have liked bitcoin in terms of its transparency because by bitcoin's ledger being transparent every actor in the market can make purchasing decisions or company decisions based on a transparent ledger data for example if bitcoin becomes the unit of account in the future through hyper bitcoinization and every single large company in the world is using bitcoin to move money around then coca-cola can publish their address that is their sales mm -hmm. and then a bottling manufacturer can watch that live and as soon as coca-cola sales hit certain levels it'll automatically there can be a script that automatically produces more bottles and so the market becomes hyper efficient as everyone can make purchasing decisions and planning decisions based on everyone else's actions and so i think hayek would have liked that because it um it doesn't necessarily solve the local knowledge problem it just makes information more transparent and efficient yeah um and it, you know what uh, because you said hayek i don't i even think um because i read an article um one of the speakers uh was i'm going to interview him tomorrow uh torsten polite um, remember uh, uh, where you talk about gold and uh, you know the whole uh, low uh, low interest rate and stuff like that. So he's he's like super like expert on on a, on a specific uh, subject, which I'm gonna talk to him about tomorrow. But I think Van Mises would have also that's a good question. You know, with a Van Mises, one you know one of the legendary Austrian communists uh, would have probably comprehended Bitcoin or the you know the 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 real evolutionary potential of Bitcoin as a non commodity money as a purely monetary money much right. more than the current Austrian economics but you know that's just being said uh, that's it's still yeah, a hypothesis because, <laughs> right I mean that's, that's why we haven't seen a lot of the gold bugs switch over yet and also I think a lot of people fundamentally don't under they can't you know really get their head around something that fluctuates so much in value uh, they consider that to be you know unstable in their whole life they've seen like very high-risk investments uh, are typically very volatile. And so they kind of viewed it as that versus actually spending the time to think about it. You know, the way that Bitcoin adoption has happened is a series of speculative bubbles where people come for the trading and stick around for the sound money. But in those boom cycles, you know, 90 out of 100 people 
don't come back because they were this, just there for the speculation. But, uh, you know, 10 out of 100 stick around and they're like, wait a second, this is really, really cool. Uh, speculative bubbles bring about greater awareness and greater adoption. Um, but it does take time and people mentally, I think it's really tough for people to wrap their head around something that fluctuates so much. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what makes it really hard, you know, the last uh, hundred years, um, I think if, why, if my grandparents or if maybe even my great grandparents were alive, they don't even know, uh, they wouldn't have known what it is like to live um, uh, and prosper under a gold uh, stand or like whatever hard money, uh, uh, you know, let alone Bitcoin. So um, th this is, I think, the, the real challenge to um, first, you know, introduce people to to the essence, to the principles, to to the basic, um, you know, pr purpose of of Bitcoin. And then on top of that, what I'm trying, you know, trying sort of to to communicate with this uh, special series, like. Okay, you know, uh, you don't feel it right now. There's no existential, you know, pain points. There's no fear. There, you know, we all have, you know, we're pretty privileged actually in this Western modernized world. But um, what, what could, you know, what kind of structures? I'm interested in the transformational, uh, you know, changes in the in the real transformational uh, structures uh, which which are possible with Bitcoin. Whether it be social, educational even the patent system. I mean, if, if all these, you know, become decentralized because the root of the system is the monetary root layer, what is possible? I mean, all these technologies, we are burning fuels for what, 100, 150 years? And we have developed and evolved on a lot of other aspects, but we haven't really solved the technological, environmental uh, and, and transport uh, systems. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, what what is possible in future? I mean, I know we are not an oracle; we cannot predict the future. But do you have like uh, I mean, do you have an understanding or opinion or a thought, a vision, what it could be like in the future? Uh, so can you reframe that question? Um, so. It could the the technological innovations? I mean, I know you know for for, for a fact that a lot of technological innovations uh, have been suppressed or whatever confiscated. We don't want to go into the rabbit hole. Confiscated in the name of national security, whatever. But I mean, on every level, on social level, educational level, school level, uh, entrepreneur level. You know, like bringing entrepreneurs together with with inventors, with uh, you know, with people who who can contribute back to society with their knowledge, with their innovation, with their technological knowledge. Um, uh, you know, uh, or or make uh, uh, technology, you know, serve humanity, <laughs> and really uh, trigger that process of civilization, which I think the Austrian economist Hoppe called it, the process of civilization. I'm just curious, uh, how could we like explain it to you know the masses of the people? It's okay if you don't feel the pain points. You know yeah. that's okay. It's not that's not most people's uh, motive in in the Western world. Uh, but maybe we can do it the other way around. Like uh, maybe we can explain to them. Listen, I mean, you're not going to be much more. You're not going to be able to save much more. Be more wealthier, freer. Um, you know, m more liberated, but also uh, have total different structures, which we can prosper as a, you know, individually, socially, and as a human civilization. I know it sounds a little bit maybe, you know, philosophical, but do you know what I'm getting at? Yeah. So the way that I think about it is that the narrative in the beginning was just crafted by a few people on Bitcoin talk and Reddit. And there wasn't guys like Safety and writing books that were much more easy to digest and that kind of comprehensively covered some of Bitcoin's topics. And I do my, my little part to, to make some parts of Bitcoin simpler. So what I call this is narrative compression. As, as the narrative gets simpler and simpler, the narrative gets compressed. And as the narrative gets compressed, it means it can be propagated more widely and understood by more and more individuals. Uh, when, you know, back in the day, if you told someone, hey, Bitcoin's this new digital currency, it's about sound money, you know, and you're, it's the year 2013, well, not many people are ready for that. And it's, it's not the right message and it's not as condensed as it can be and it doesn't explain why they need it. 
And so I, I see a future where we'll continue to see the narrative get compressed and more compressed and more compressed. And then there'll be a moment where society will be looking for a solution like Bitcoin because they'll, know, they'll notice big problems. And then there'll be this a story that's simple enough for them to understand. <clears throat> and so I, uh, there's, a, there's a moment in uh, the movie Inception. So Inception is a movie around uh, they're trying to convince the son of a billionaire to break up, a, break up his father's empire after he dies. Mm -hmm. And so there's a scene where Leo DiCaprio is trying to recruit Tom Hardy onto the team that's going to help incept this idea. And Leo goes, hey, I've got a crazy idea. It's called Inception. And Tom goes, well, it's not that crazy, but you have to start with the root of the idea. And he goes, with, with what we're trying to do, we don't start with the, the idea of breaking up his father's empire. We start with his relationship with his father. That's the core inception. And so for wow. Bitcoin, it is not sound money. It is not digital currency. It's none of that. Mm -hmm. First, we have, to, we have to touch on the core root of what people are really, really wanting. And we have to touch on their, their anxieties and their worries around the future. That's what it is. And, and governments will continually disappoint people and people don't know they need Bitcoin until they lose faith in their government. And so the, what we need to incept is, hey, have you ever questioned the nature of your government? Have you ever questioned that? That's what we start with. We can't start with, we can't point at a solution if they don't know what the problem is. And so I think that's kind of the first step here is, is making sure they understand, wait, I can't trust my banking system. Wait, I can't trust my central bank. And then then they start to wonder, well, what can I trust? And that's where Bitcoin comes in. Wow, yeah, so true, so true. I mean, do, do you see, do you think we need to wait for some conditions or parameters to set in so that people wake up and start questioning? We, we, know, we never learned that. Most people, even myself, I woke up too late, you know, like questioning the paradigm, the, you know, the system, the, the, you know, the whole, this whole matrix we want to call it, whatever, you know, even the educational system. I went to university, you know, it's, it's like you start, if some people are lucky, you know, they wake up to the, to these facts, to the reality. And it's like, you know, where am I, you know, uh, do you think it needs to like compress as you maybe, maybe, you know, wait for these, um, you know, specific conditions to set in or, or is it, or does it depend like on the pedagogical educational uh, method of teaching? Well, yeah, you know, certainly if, uh, let's put it this way, if the banking system was fine, then no one would care about Bitcoin. So <laughs> the reason why Bitcoin exists is that the banking system is not okay but people have to wake up to that reality. Um, and that unfortunately that typically doesn't happen in a linear fashion. It typically takes forever to happen and then it happens in a second, just like the 2008 financial crisis. People don't, people don't care to worry about it if things look to be okay. So I do think it'll be very much uh, based on uh, sort of, you know, one of these sort of uh, moments. I think it'll be more instantaneous than it'll be linear. Um, as Bitcoin's adoption has largely been a series of speculative bubbles, this will simply be one massive mega bubble. Um, you know, there hasn't been a, a, lot, a crisis of faith with financial institutions uh, since Bitcoin was created. Bitcoin was created right in the middle of, of or planted, the, you know, the seed of Bitcoin is planted right in the middle of our last financial crisis, but there hasn't been one again. So I'm, I've waited seven years to see this moment and I think Bitcoin will be very well positioned to where if the happening event occurs, if you know Bitcoin ETF gets created, if more institutional individuals get in, that you know if there's a financial crisis in the year 2021 to 2023, uh, Bitcoin might have the biggest bull run in, in its history, uh, just because it'll people will use it for its intended purpose. You know, people have basically just been buying Bitcoin as a speculative store of value asset. But if people actually use it as a store of value and as a risk off asset when the whole world, you know, when there's a crisis of faith in financial institutions, I mean, this isn't going to be a normal bubble. This isn't just a normal speculative retail cycle. This is all of the money in the world seeking to store their, you know, that value somewhere that can't be seized and is immutable in terms of where you can send it. So I, I think it'll be a, a huge, huge moment um, where a massive amount of money shifts over.
totally right yeah i mean we don't want to throw i don't want to throw around with numbers but you know it's it's really grotesque and absurd if you look at the uh, you know like the global debt number it's like official just a sort of normal debt number it's like 250 trillion and then if you add up to the unfunded liabilities and derivatives you come to a number like it's like 1,800 trillion. I mean, uh, three quarters of a quadrillion. And then, you know, this whole, I mean, um, you know, I think people are going to appreciate Bitcoin once they see, oh my God, if it wasn't for Bitcoin, there would be no smooth transition because otherwise it would be huge disruption, right? For a lot of people, a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, uh, you know, all these things that are going on with this, you know, with all these whatever false flags, uh, trade wars, currency wars, which are, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of currency wars going on, you know, circumventing the international reserve currency of the dollar, the U.S. Federal Reserve, like, you know, cr credit expanding, pumping trillions into the stock market. So all these things, I think, add up, add up as an aggregate bubble, right? Yeah, definitely. Um... Well, you know, if uh, I recommend everyone go read Deutsche Bank's A Journey into the Unknown uh, 2012 asset, Long-Term Asset Management Study. Mm -hmm. And so what they did is they looked across 800 years of financial history, and we have truly never been in a moment like this before. Um, so <laughs> when people go, oh, this is fine, you know, yeah, sure, debt levels are a little high. No, no, it's never been, never been this high ever across all these countries all at once. Um, I mean, the outcome is somewhat predictable. It's they're going to print money. Um, it's just what they're going to do. And, you know, I think uh, the important metrics to look at are like debt to GDP ratio. Um, but yeah, also looking at like future unfunded liabilities, like uh, Social Security for the United States um, and other programs. It, in, in what happened is, you know, everyone starts to have a little cut of of you know the revenue from the government and the government becomes bigger and more people make money from the government so they vote more uh, you know policies in for the government that that grow it you know for example all the employees that work at all the government agencies you know they're going to vote for pro government spending same with the defense industry and other industries and eventually that just reaches a breaking point to where <clears throat> it's it's not going to be funded and when people have the option to store their value where it's extremely hard so the government can seize the money if they they could try to seize the money. Mm -hmm. um, you can try to seize someone's Bitcoins, but it's going to be a whole lot harder and, and not really scalable compared to the existing banking system. So I think it's just going to be a really natural organic move where governments try to print more money, dilute the purchasing power of their citizens, you know, negative interest rates, you know, essentially try to, you know, enforce sort of, uh, you know, taking a certain percentage of, you know, maybe the United States goes and hit and says, Hey, actually these 401ks, um, we're going to take a little bit more than we said, you know, which, which is probably going to happen. Right. And so, and which most people would consider unfathomable now it's like, well, could it happen? Yes. <laughs> and, and do they have a strong motivation to? Yes. So, uh, that's where I think, <clears throat> you know, Bitcoin just becomes a super organic choice when given the option between dilution and seizure, you know, a seizure of your money. Um, it's just kind of like, well, why wouldn't I have Bitcoin? It's, it's a, I think a pretty easy decision. So I think that takes a long time though. And I think it'll happen in, in sort of those moments when governments, you know, start to panic. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's sort of an, I see it almost inevitable. I just don't really see this train stopping and I don't see how Bitcoin doesn't exponentially increase from here as, you know, right now there's maybe only 20 million hodlers in the whole world. What happens really? when, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. What happens if there's 200 million or a billion, mm -hmm. right? And, and what happens when like, you know, the hodlers so far have just been retail money. Like what happens when the big money, the institutional money moves in, <laughs> you know, you know, Yale puts in a billion dollars or something, right? You know, that's, we, we haven't, uh, let's put it this way. We haven't even seen the main show yet. Things are about to get really cool. Yeah, that's so good to know. <laughs> So we are still in this phase, more or less in the store of value phase, you know, so the next phase would be like scaling as a medium of exchange and then unit of account and the rate of speed, which the, you know, the developers, the coder, the cryptographers, you know, all these people who are really working so hard, 
you know, whether it be Lightning Network, second layer, uh, privacy, you know, the, the, the improvement of privacy, of fungibility. Do you see this process like exponentially increasing and then, you know, like that, you know, uh, it just happens and people are starting to trade, uh, you know, to transact on a much more scalable, regular basis. Um, yeah, I think, you, you know, Bitcoin being used as a, like, you know, cheap or not, sorry, not cheap, uh, small payment values for like your day-to-day -day transactions. I think it's a pretty simple calculation. It's, is Bitcoin's volatility lower than my local fiat currency's volatility? I think that's basically going to determine if someone wants to use, uh, you know, Bitcoin over lightning to pay for a cup of coffee, you know, it, 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 it's a combination of volatility problem, a combination of the coordination problem, which is I'm not going to go, if I go to 10 merchants and only one accepts Bitcoin, I'm probably going to stop asking if they accept Bitcoin because it's just more of a pain in the ass, right? Like everyone accepts Visa, MasterCard everywhere. I don't have to worry about that. But if there's a new credit card called Dan credit card, and you asked everywhere and, and almost no one takes it, then it's going to get really old really fast. So the coordination problem would be, you know, the merchants would all need to adopt Bitcoin. You know, if, if a company like Square, uh, you know, adds Bitcoin payments, then that that definitely kind of leapfrogs all of the problem, you know, of, of having each, each unique merchant uh, adopt Bitcoin. So it's a volatility problem, the coordination problem. And, uh, you know, just, I think, in general, like a demand problem, like, you know, people always talk about Bitcoin merchants. Oh, it's great for merchants. I'm like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> uh, cool. Yeah, they don't have any fees, but like who wants to pay with it? You know, so merchants, you know, I, I don't think it'll be widely adopted until many, many, many people have and, and hodl Bitcoin. Um, because then you, your potential base of users who might want to might, might want to buy goods and services is large and, and will warrant time and effort it spends to, to keep a, uh, whether it be e-commerce or in-person, keep a payment processing for Bitcoin up and running. Mm -hmm. Okay. What would you say is the critical mass adoption rate? I mean, is there, can we put like a number to it? Is it like a half a billion or a few hundred million? I mean, what's, what would be like, what would trigger the chain reaction? Yeah, I mean, I don't... <laughs> You know, I think it's going to be a crisis of faith with financial institutions mm -hmm. and governments. And so the tipping point may not be a number of people. I would say it's a an, number of assets or like there were like a, essentially Bitcoin's market cap. Uh, if Bitcoin's market cap, you know, I think a few trillion is, is simply a glimmer of what Bitcoin might be. You know, at a few trillion, Bitcoin is like, I'm a contender for a global store of value. Um, I think, you know, Bitcoin becomes sort of an unstoppable train in terms of the annual spend on mining, which protects the network. Um, I think at around 10 trillion, Bitcoin becomes just this super massive black hole that sucks in everything else. At 10 trillion, it will have existed for so long. Uh, the liquidity will be so high and the you know, amount of services and the strength of the security of the network will be so large that it becomes unstoppable. Yeah. And if the numbers are correct, uh, the uh, sort of the market cap or whatever it's called, the market valuation of gold is finally 8 trillion. So it's like a little bit more than the, you know, the, the market valuation of gold, right? So uh, if, if those numbers are correct. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, gold is only worth 7.5 trillion. And if mm -hmm. you look at all the fiat money in the world, I think that's at like 40 trillion mm -hmm. and all real estate in the world is 250 trillion yeah and then you look at all these other stores of value i mean we, <laughs> people forget that like all of those assets can be seized <laughs> right like what are people willing to pay for something that can never be taken away from them yeah and it's happened before right i mean just history has been repeating itself they have you know they they confiscated gold right when was it in the 30s or uh yeah, they did. And that's where Satoshi had his birth date. Yeah. As the, uh, yeah, the birth day was the day gold was seized in the U.S. and the birth year was the year that gold was made legal again. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess Satoshi even made a play at that. Mm -hmm. 
You know, Dan, I mean, uh, first of all, again, I found those heated discussions really, I learned a lot during those discussions at the Value of Bitcoin conference in Munich. Um, now, do you think, uh, because there were, you know, a few of those central bankers, do you, and sort of, uh, you know, other experts in their, res you know, respective fields, um, you know, playing around with some parameters or cutting out, uh, I mean, it was so obvious, you know, the guy who was uh, drawing this, this graph with, um, uh, what, what was it, the, the, the growth of Bitcoin, but then he left out the other five years, so he didn't have, like, the total 10 years. Um, do you think it's like intentionally, consciously, you know, a, a combination of ignorance, of non-comprehension, or, you know, or, or is it just stubbornness? Well, you know, I don't think they've ever really had to question the nature of the reality. Like they're, they've been like, the central bankers have been like the, uh, the high priests, right? Yeah. So no one questions the nature of the religion until people are like, wait a second, actually, this doesn't make any sense. Um, so, they, you know, central bankers don't normally have to defend themselves. And I think at the value of Bitcoin, we saw a few circumstances where like, you know, Safedine had a debate and was essentially, you know, it's, they, they never had to defend their policies and they didn't view inflation as theft. They viewed it as like increasing demand. Um, you know, the base, basic principles is, you know, with Keynesian economics is that like the central bankers can somehow understand and control demand and which is <laughs> kind of ridiculous considering the, the, the data problem involved. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think just they've never had to, they've never had to question how it all works. Most of them don't understand money or the subtle nuances of money that like money is stored energy and time. Most don't understand physics. Um, most don't understand that it's a data problem, which requires like a data science background instead of an economics background. Um, it's it's pretty simple. It's just a data problem. There's no yeah. way that a central entity can ingest enough data points and then press perfect levers to then influence the economy. Um, there's just too many chaotic. The, the the economy is just too chaotic. And you know, for example, when I go in and I order a sandwich today, I went into the store and ordered one. Well. Who knows that until, you know, sometimes I don't even know what I want until I get there. You know, so how is a centralized entity going to plan the economy around that? A really Keynesian economics is, is kind of an extension of socialism because socialism is about planning every single part of the economy. And Keynesian economics is about planning uh, sort of the, you know, the uh, having levers to plan kind of the, the underlying risks of the entire economy, which is both are measures of control. Exactly. Um, you know, I heard Andreas Antonopoulos' uh, uh, talk uh, was uh, yesterday or a few days ago, and where he said, uh, you know, if we really want to help people, we need first a foundation. You know, and I've been, I've been also, you know, a great uh, advocate of this. Like, you know, we cannot talk about, you know, uh, there's so many like shitcoin projects and blockchain and distributed ledger technology. I mean, it's good. We're learning from a lot of other projects. Uh, he's right in that point, but then he also emphasizes we need a foundation first. It's like, but you know, it's I compare that like with building a house you cannot build a house on a toxic non-stable uh and 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 uh, you know unhealthy soil we need we need a healthy soil you know like you in your articles you you write about the soil um so sometimes it makes me sad that there is not a focus uh, a concentrated effort to collectively, at least, you know, in the broader, whatever we want to call it, you know, Bitcoin, crypto, blockchain community to focus on the, uh, you know, on the foundation. <laughs> um, where do you yeah, see I mean, this going? I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. Like people go, well, why aren't you excited about other projects? And I'm like, I, I, I have high standards. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, proof of work is about physics. And if you want to start shilling me proof of stake, I'm just not going to be interested because it's not rooted in physics and is simply going back to the old systems that we had. Okay. Um, and, you know, people are like, oh, well, uh, well, oh, how about this pre-mined coin? And I'm like, well, it had a poor distribution. So again, I'm not interested. Like Litecoin's cool because it had no pre-mined. But with all these other coins, I'm like, well, if it has a pre-mined, I'm not interested. And then it's like, oh, well, we're going to choose an inflation rate. I'm like, and not interested because Satoshi's entire purpose of having a 21 million hard cap was that no one 
then has to decide what the proper rate of inflation is because choosing a proper inflation rate is impossible. So, and then also it's like, well, um, oh, well, you know, we rolled back transactions on Ethereum because of a mistake with the DAO. And I'm like, cool, well, that definitely not interested after that. Um, and then, oh, well, you know, we have a founder who works in this protocol. I'm like, cool, well, that definitely makes me not interested. So, you know, it's like, well, it's, I'd, I'd like to be interested in something else, but it just does, there's not a lot of check marks that uh, most of these projects could check. Exactly. And, you know, we, by, by saying all these things, they actually admit to their own flaws. So it's, it's exactly all, all these things that they're saying is actually exactly the opposite of the unique features, characteristics and architecture, you know, decentralized, open, neutral, censorship resistant. Uh, uh, I don't know, what, what, whatever you, you know, what, whatever comes up to, to your mind now also, but uh, uh, it, they're actually admitting it. Uh, and it's become so obvious that this is not the architecture that's going to be working on, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it has to be, you know, to build a building, you have to have a really solid foundation and Bitcoins has the most solid foundation. Um, you know, with Ethereum, it's kind of like building skyscrapers on skyscrapers. Um, they haven't really solved a lot of the core underlying issues and they, they plan on changing so many different things. And that's where, you know, as Satoshi said, like the rules have been kind of hard coded in and, and he's right. The whole point is that by making tons of decisions about base, like layer one changes, whether that be the monetary policy or structure, you're building like a shifting sand underneath your foundation. Uh, you know, if that sand's constantly shifting, it's really hard for everyone else to plan and, and, and work around that. And also you've now introduced a social attack vector where humans again have, have are now able to put their input in and the more humans have put their input in and that becomes political and then people start to debate as to what should go in and they become, can become very divisive. Um, that's where you can't have, you know, it, essentially Bitcoin with like the 21 million hard cap was a brilliant idea because <laughs> Satoshi knew that there would be endless debates about the proper rate of inflation. So that's where when I see Ethereum arbitrarily choose the rate of inflation, I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's just so stupid and ridiculous that it's like, it's, it's just a repeat of the FOMC all over again. And I'm like, wow. Okay. So we've literally just built the same thing again. Exactly. And you know, it's just a matter of time till, I mean, people like Adam Back and his team, I mean, whatever projects there are, I don't want to name them, but whether it be Blockstream or these guys with this, uh, with their liquid and side chains, people now working in on the satellite mesh, mesh network, it's like really an unbelievable, incredible, you know, a rate of speed that it's developing. So everything, you know, people are like dreaming about like projects and, and you know, tracking and, and whatever logistics, it can all be... This can all be built on the Bitcoin protocol, right? It's just a matter of time. Yeah, that's where, you know, blockchains are not about running code, but I mean, blockchains need to have like most minimally, minimally be around transaction val or like essentially validation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, Bitcoin with uh, Schnorr and, and Taproot and Graftroot or Taproot and Graftroot specifically, you know, those bring about a lot of other smart contract and scripting uh, that we can then use Bitcoin for, um, which is really, really cool. I think, yeah, Bitcoin can do almost everything that people are looking for. I, I think it's doing it in a way that's much more intelligent and, and much more methodical rather than going YOLO, let's just add everything at once and see what happens. Um, also like with Taproot and Graftroot, what's really cool is that, uh, and to the best of my knowledge, because uh, this is kind of advanced, but to the best of my knowledge, how it works is that essentially, if you have a computer program or if you have a, a smart contract and there's all these conditions that can be met, the only thing that gets printed on chain is the condition that was met. So you don't, you don't print on chain all the other conditions that were never met, which is good for privacy and good for uh, data size. So Bitcoin is about being hyper efficient with that block space that is secured by Bitcoin's proof of work. Exactly. So it's, it's so, I mean, it's everything so logical and ethical and I wish more and more people like you, you know, and others in the Bitcoin hardcore community would, would follow up on that and, 
and and really work together uh, in, you know instead of uh, you know creating so much friction and controversy and um i wish there was a little bit more concentrated effort in educating also the masses uh making it i think it's just a matter of time it won't take long till we have this plug and play uh, you know the easy use applications this is really urgently needed uh, right now and otherwise yeah we need to yeah educate and 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 you know share this knowledge as you're doing right now so thank you so much for your time uh dan uh, is do you, do you have any, like any other uh comments or thoughts you know where we're heading to or what are you working on or you know where people can find you yeah i mean you can find me on twitter uh, at dan held or on uh you know danheld.com is my website as well i uh you know, I'm, on my website, I've got a collection of all my different resources, whether it be blogs, um, and also the other resources or other content that other people have created. I think, uh, you know, something that I'd like to bring up is my next article will be on Bitcoin's monetary policy. Wow. Or why Satoshi chose the 21 million hard cap. Beautiful. And this one, I think, is going to be really, really fun. Um, it won't be as long as the security model one, which was my last one. That one was kind of a beast to get through. But this one is really fun because it goes into the information theory of money, which is essentially that money is a reflection of information in the market. And so this one, I think a lot of people don't appreciate why Bitcoin has a 21 million hard cap. Most are like, oh, we're just going to go build cool tech and then we'll figure out the monetary policy later. And that's where I think this article will really hammer home that the only way to build a monetary policy is to do this. And that's the innovation in Bitcoin is the 21 million hard cap. It's not a cool new way to do this or that. It, those are cool functions like smart contracts, but the, the brilliance wasn't just the code. It was also the parameter set. Exactly. The 21 million hard cap is a critical decision that is honestly one of the biggest innovations in human history. <laughs> you, you said it, you, you nailed it. Because every time I talk to people who are totally new to Bitcoin, I say, listen, you know gold, it's re it has a relative scarcity, right? So people know gold already. But what if it, there is a store of value, a, a money that is totally, absolutely scarce? There is no more than 21 million. And I think people finally get it, you know, but it's like, okay, but you know, it has to sit in, sink in, and then, you know, it takes time to process. I think this, this comp simple, pretty simple comprehension, I guess, but, you know, the other sort of consequences, positive consequences out of it. Totally, totally. So, yeah, I think, you know, that's, I, I wrote all of my content to address different issues that I think people didn't understand, like, you know, around what, what role do hodlers play? Was Bitcoin's distribution fair? was uh, you know, how Bitcoin's proof of work energy works, Bitcoin's origin story, like why did Satoshi make Bitcoin? And then you know, with the monetary policy, that's kind of a big one that a lot of people haven't thought about or yes. haven't, haven't spent a lot of time digging into. So I hope people will like it. Oh, I'm sure. I can't wait to read it. Wonderful. It's really overdue, really, because it, it really contributes a lot to the educational process. And, uh, and then, you know, and, and I think you were really one of the few ones, Dan, that can break down this, uh, you know, this complex language with its with technological terminology, economical, financial. There's not many people, you know, like you, Safedan, that really can break this down and, 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 and filter out, you know, all this, um, you know, over academic intellectualized <laughs> language. You know what I'm saying? It's like, we, I think um, we need a little bit more empathy with, with the masses because uh, they don't have the time yeah and honestly i think a lot of the people in this space that are thought leaders have no idea really how this all works uh, as segway 2x and as like the bcash side as we saw there i mean they fundamentally didn't under understand bitcoin uh, so i think to explain something simply means you understand it completely and yeah. i think not many people actually understand these things completely yeah you know, I always uh, sort of try to extrapolate from my perception and understanding. I'm like, if I'm if I feel overwhelmed, then how must other people feel like? You know, right. like I have the time, the luxury of time, you know, to study, to read, to listen. I mean, I'm doing this in my free time, sort of as my contribution, as my you know, I share my knowledge, and this is why I'm doing these interviews. I'm like, this is our moment. This is our moment in human history. I mean, it's never been done before. You know, and uh, I call it evolution. We have no time for revolutions. It's time for evolution, monetary evolution. <laughs> totally. Yeah, well, we're, we're almost there. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me today. I had a great time chatting and 
hope to see you in another conference uh, here soon. Yeah, hope to hope to see you soon, Dan. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Cheers. See ya. Bye bye. Cheers. Ciao.